One of them said to me, explain to me the Trinity. And I looked him straight in the eye. And I said, I can't. He wasn't ready for that answer. He thought I was going to try and explain something that would get me into deep water and embarrassment, and then he would laugh at me. I looked at him straight in the eye and said, I can't. And he didn't know what to say for a moment. I kept my eye on him and I said, I'll tell you why I can't. And before he could answer, I said, I can't explain the Trinity to you because God never explained it to me. I said, you can't even explain Jehovah God. And he wasn't ready for that challenge. I said, a being who has no beginning, Jehovah God, no beginning, can you explain that? Human beings can't explain that because we are locked into time. We have beginnings and endings, beginnings and endings. Everything's beginning and endings in our existence. We're born and we die. We get up in the morning, we go to bed at night. The day begins, the day ends, and all that sort of thing. Beginnings and endings. We are locked into time, but God is not locked into time like that. Everything is like present tense to him, which is something we can't explain, but that's what uh, it amounts to. So anyway, I, uh, I'm not going to go on further onto the subject of the Trinity today because I want to get on to the subject that I've chosen today. But uh, maybe we should start recording now and, and um, look at the topic that I've prepared for today. You see, Ellen White said talking about the human nature of Jesus. The divinity did not die. And you recall what Jesus said? No man taketh my life from me. I'm quoting Matthew. This commandment I've received from my Father. I lay down my life. Can you finish it? I have power to take it up. How could a dead man have power to take up his own life? Because Jesus was a blend of the human and the divine, or the divine and the human. As Ellen White says, the two natures were blended together to make a unified being. He was not schizophrenic, uh, you know, one personality and a different personality in one body. They were blended to make one person with two natures, human and divine, divine and human. And his human nature is what died on the cross. That's why Jesus came in the incarnation, so that he could die. Because as God in heaven, he could not die. So Jesus had to come as a man in order to die. But when he died, his human nature died. Don't ask me to explain how his divine nature still lived on and how his divine nature then resurrected his human nature, I don't know. But Ellen White says that when the angel came and called Jesus, your father calls you. Ellen White says Jesus arose from the grave, you read in the Desire of Ages, by the power of the life that was within himself. What life was that? His divine life. So his divine life resurrected his human life. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up, he said. Now, these are mysteries that we can't explain, so don't try and explain them. Just believe them, because inspiration tells us. You see, there's two ways that you can have knowledge. You can have knowledge by logic. Where everything's explained logically. Or you can have knowledge which is believed by faith. We can be just as strong or stronger than logic knowledge. Now, people laugh at us Christians because we've got faith in what the Bible says and believe a lot of things by faith. But believe me, the evolutionists believe everything by faith too. <laughs> they laugh at us, but they're laughing at themselves if they looked in the mirror. Because the doctrine of evolution says everything came from nothing. Can you explain that? They can't explain that. Everything came from nothing. Nothing, nothing. No energy, no matter. Nothing. 
Everything comes from nothing. That's, that's ridiculous. But they, they believe it by faith, and yet they mock us because we have faith in God who created. So you see, the, it's not an even playing field when it comes to debating with some of these folk because they don't realize that they're exercising just as much faith or more faith than what we have to do. All right. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Great is the mystery of godliness. Well, this study this afternoon is not dealing with the question of the divinity of Jesus and the nature of the Trinity, or the Godhead, as some people prefer to call it. That's an accepted doctrine by Seventh-day Adventists, and I'm able, quite able to defend the doctrine that we believe of the Godhead, and I've got a whole study on it. In fact, when I was in Russia, three or four years ago now, remember the big chart on last day events that you got? I showed it to the Russian publishing house and I said, would you like to um, print this in Russian language for your church members here? And they looked at it and they said, yes, we could do that. And they have done it. And they did it in, in several colours. Did a better job of it than the ones that you saw, which is just plain black and white. They did it in colours. And they did it in two sizes, the big one, the full size like you've got, and they did a smaller one as well. And they printed 4,000 copies. You know, we printed 10,000 of the English ones, that, uh, like you've got. 10,000 of them have been printed, but the Russians printed 4,000 in Russian language for their members. And then the, one of the editor or the manager of the Russian publishing house said to me, could you write a book of studies to go with it to make it more valuable? And I said, uh, yes, I, I can do that. So when I came home, I got my lecture notes, put them in the computer, copy and paste it and so on. And then I just started at the beginning of my notes and turned it all into essays. And Sharon helped me a lot on that. <laughs> hours and hours and hours of work she did. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> and I, I've written a book. 105,000 words, 140 or so pages, 26 chapters sent a copy of it down to Warburton to be printed by the Science Publishing Company and the book editor wrote back and said, not interested. Maybe we need some of our church members around the division to start writing letters to the sign saying we're wanting this book because we, you know it's been written and we want to get it printed, you know. At the moment it's over in Washington, D.C. being looked at by the Review and Herald. But I haven't heard what they're doing about it. But I pray about it. I said, Lord, this book is defending Adventism, because you know I'm loyal to the church, loyal to the, my backbone, defending the church, and I'm not interested in any offshoot movements or any subversive movements. I defend the church and its teachings. But uh, they have to look at it and assess it. And uh, so we're waiting on a word from them. In that book, I have... 26 chapters, and one of the chapters is this chapter that I'm giving you this evening. And if you want a copy of it, you've got a photocopy machine here, you can have a photocopy, make copies, and distribute to everybody who wants a copy. You can have that for free. When the book comes, well, please buy a book too, because it's got all the other topics in it. <laughs> all right. Deuteronomy 29.29 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the works, words of this law. The secret things belong to God, but that which has been revealed belongs to us. So this afternoon we'll look at what has been revealed to us and see what we can find about the human nature of Jesus, because this topic has been the debated topic in the Adventist church for years. I grew up as a boy believing one way, but I've had to change my theology and change it to something else because I saw the evidence. I'll share that evidence with you this afternoon. 
the, the, the difference in this debate is uh, seen in the writings of some of the offshoot groups that we have among us, some of the independent ministries that call themselves Adventists, but then they write and things against the church and call, accuse the church of teaching wrong things. That uh, Jesus was exactly the same as us. That he was born with a sinful, carnal human nature, just like Adam had after he sinned. That's, many Adventists believe that. That's what I believed when I was taught that as a boy. There are others in the church that say, no, he does not have a sinful, carnal human nature. He's more like what Adam was before Adam sinned as far as his moral nature was concerned. Not talking about his physical nature because he accepted the working of the law of heredity, as Ellen White says. You see, Adam, we, some people have said Adam was probably about 12 feet tall. Maybe, maybe weighed about a ton. He'd be good on the rugby football field, wouldn't he? Man, he could take the ball and just walk to the other end of the field with the fake hanging on each leg and he'd just keep walking and keep walking and put the ball down to make a try. Couldn't stop him. Ton, one ton man walking down the field with people hanging on his legs and can't stop him. Jesus wasn't 12 feet tall when he came. Ellen White says he accepted the outworking of the great law of heredity and came in weakened human nature. Degenerate physical nature. He wasn't as strong as Adam. Didn't have the power to endure hard work like Adam could have done. He accepted what the standard was at his time in human history. These people that say that Jesus has to be exactly the same as we are uh, argue this way. Jesus came with exactly the same nature that we have and he lived a life without sinning. Therefore, he demonstrated to us that we can live a life without sinning. They go into perfectionism. My answer to that is, well, if that was required as part of the plan of salvation, then Jesus made that demonstration that it's possible to live without sinning at 2,000 years too soon because the human race has degenerated even further from what it was in the time of Adam and what it was in the time of Jesus. We've had 2,000 more years of human history since the time of Jesus in which more weaknesses have crept into the human genetics. So he should make that demonstration in the very last generation, not 2,000 years ago. You get my argument? You follow that? If you can't argue that he had to make that demonstration to prove that we can live without sinning, he made it 2,000 years too soon because we, we're weaker now than what the people were back in the days of John the Baptist. 2,000 more years of degeneration have crept into the human race. So... Deuteronomy tells us there are some things which are secret to God. Paul states the mystery of the incarnation is a mystery we cannot explain, not by any known human laws. How can a virgin give birth without an earthly father? Well, these folk that uh, want to argue about the nature of Jesus sometimes say that uh, the Father didn't create him. I don't think there are many Adventists that say that Jesus was created. The fact that they're arguing about the Trinity and the Adventist church are arguing about the, the um, fact or the way that the Jesus came about by being born from the Father. I was in another church somewhere in Australia. I was in the middle of my lecture and a man stood up in the, in the church and in a loud voice he said, the, the Father did not create the Son. And I can say amen to that because that's the Jehovah's Witness doctrine. We don't agree with them. But the Father gave birth to him by a process that we do not understand. So this is what some Adventists are saying. Father gave birth to Jesus, you see. Well, we, we don't accept that. If that is a truth then there was a time before his birth that he didn't exist, right? And the Bible clearly tells us that he came from, existed from all eternity. 
So they're not following what the Bible says when they preach that doctrine. So the mystery of the incarnation cannot be explained by any known human laws. However, the Greek word for mystery in 1 Timothy 3.16 is musterion, musterion, which in the New Testament usually refers to something that God wills to make known to those who are willing to receive the revelation. So some things have been revealed to us. The fact that Jesus was born of a virgin has been revealed to us. But how? We are not told. We don't know what God did to make a virgin conceive. All we can say is we believe what the record says that it happened. And Mary bore Jesus without a human father. If you want a Bible reference for that, look at Commentary, Volume 6, page 610. What God has revealed for us is for our study and understanding. But what is not revealed is better left alone. That's hard for some people to do. You know that? Some people have got a, the, the human nature is that they must have an answer for everything. Okay? But brethren and sisters, we cannot give an answer for everything. <coughs> Because those things which are not revealed, we're told are not for us to know, not in this life anyway. We've been given enough to know in this life that we can find and obtain and get salvation. That's what we should concentrate on. Not trying to solve all the mysteries of the Godhead because it's beyond us. We never solve them in this life, if ever. What God has revealed for us <coughs> is for our study and understanding, but it is not what, knows, what is not revealed is better left alone. Based on what God has revealed, we can come to a better understanding of the great wonder of the Incarnation. <laughs> the, date, the, the debate has raised, as I said, in some quarters on the question of the nature of human nature of Jesus. Was it pre-lapsarian? Lapsarian means a lapse, a fall. When Adam sinned, he lapsed. It, was it pre-lapsarian, like Adam before he sinned, or was it like Adam after he sinned? That's called post-lapsarianism. Pre-lapsarianism, post-lapsarianism. These are theological terms. If you look them up on Google and the, and the um, internet, you'll find these terms uh, there and, and, and people explaining them uh, to you and uh, giving you sources and things you can read. So the question about the physical nature of Jesus is, is something that has been debated. And I know of one former General Conference man who said, <coughs> he, was, he said, I, I grew up as a boy gee, believing that Jesus had sinful human nature and I've believed it all my life. I can't see anything else. And he was a General Conference president. So this divide in the church has gone, you know, it's right up there at the top. This was a few years ago now. I don't know that there's still that problem. I think that particular General Conference president has long since gone to his rest. But uh, this has been a problem in the Adventist church and some of the independent ministries are arguing for sinful human nature and the, most of the church theologians that I know are arguing for prelapsarian nature. So let's look at what the Bible has to say. Some verses in Scripture that some use to build support for the post-lapsarian teaching, that is, that he had sinful human nature, really should be understood as referring to the physical nature that Jesus inherited, not moral nature. For example, Romans 8.3. It says that Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And many theologians have pointed out that likeness is not the same as sameness. Get it? Likeness, but not sameness. All right. Hebrews 2.17, Wherefore in all things it behoves him to be make, made like unto his brethren. They say, oh, well, if he's made like unto his brethren, he has to have a sinful nature. That's what they say. Keeping this thought in mind, <coughs> we need to look for a solution to the problem, the debate. And uh, I have studied this topic and this question for, I suppose, decades. And uh, I'd like to submit to you a solution to the problem to bring these two warring sides together into unity, like we heard about this morning, Pastor Ron. Be united. 
together. Stop fighting about it. See the truth uh, of both sides because some people, you see, the, the, the trouble is when you get an idea and you want to back it, you look for Bible verses that support your idea and you look for spiritual prophecy quotes that support your idea and you, and you tend to ignore the ones that say the opposite. Yeah. Happens all the time. Both sides. Both sides are guilty of it sometimes. So we quote Bible and spirit of prophecy selectively. The passages that we think clearly support our position. And the other side does the same. And quote passages and Bible verses and spirit of prophecy quotes that seem to support their position. We need to look at the whole body of evidence, both sides, and find a, a harmony where they bring the two of them together and come up with a truth that explains everything. That's what we need to do. All right. We put out a book on questions and doctrines some years ago. You know, I was a student in the seminary in America, and uh, Pastor Roy Allen Anderson was the ministerial secretary of the General Conference. And uh, he had been an evangelist in New Zealand many years before, be before I was born. And my father worked on his evangelistic team on one occasion when he was working in the North New Zealand Conference. And so Pastor Anderson and my father were friends throughout their life. My parents were living in New Zealand. I was studying over in America. I'd, I'd got, just got married. And my wife and I were living in Washington, D.C. area, just outside of the District of Columbia border, but attending the seminary, which is just inside the border. And I came up to graduation, and my parents couldn't afford to jump on an airplane and fly over to my graduation in America because they never had that sort of money. I mean, all the years that I was at home in my father's home as a boy, in my teenage years, my father never even had a bank account. He had no money to put in the bank. Every month or fortnight, he got his pay from the conference, and it was all gone before the next pay came. Talk about living from hand to mouth. I mean, it's true. He had a big family, six, uh, six children, five or six children in the, in the family. There were seven of us all together, but the oldest girl was married before the youngest one was born. The oldest girl was an adopted girl. She was married before the youngest one was born. And so <coughs> they didn't have the money for all the things that they would like to have had. Jesus accepted humanity. I, I'm quoting questions on doctrine. I was telling you that uh, I went to Pastor Anderson and said to him, my father and mother can't come to my graduation, but you worked, my father worked with you in New Zealand years ago. Would you like to come to my graduation and sort of stand in as an honorary <laughs> relative, friend of my father? So he did. He was very gracious. And he said, we've got some Protestant ministers coming to discuss theology with us. This is Barnhouse and Martin, for those of you that know the book Questions on Doctrine. They came, and he said, I'm getting ready for the, the, the meeting, coming in a few days, and I'm doing some study and getting together some quotations and things to answer their questions, because they're going to ask questions. They're going to write a book about us. And these men said to our men at the General Conference, we've written a book against the Jehovah's Witnesses. We've written one against the Mormons. We've written one against one, one or two other groups uh, that don't square with the Adventists, well, with Bible doctrines. And we're going to write a book about you, but we don't want to quote your enemies as to what you believe. We want it from your mouth, what you believe. And lo and behold, they came down and they, they said, we, we, uh, we're not concerned about the Sabbath. We know that the, what you teach about the Sabbath. We know your position on the Sabbath. and We're not worried about that. We want to know what you believe about Jesus. Hmm. Was he fully human and fully divine? These questions, yes. Did he die a vicarious death, taking our sins upon him on the cross? Yes. Ah, and they said, oh, you, you Adventists are real Christians after all. We're not going to write a book against you because you are born-again Christians. Well, we knew that all along, didn't we? <laughs> 
we knew it all along that we were true Bible Christians. And now these Protestant ministers were finding it out for the first time. They wrote a book about us and said that we were genuine Christians. They could have fellowship with us. And that we put out a book to answer the questions they raised. And oh, that created this real controversy because a lot of the people who believed Jesus had sinful human nature didn't like the position taken in questions on doctrine. And there's a debate gone on in the Adventist church for the last 50 years over that question and over that book. So <clears throat> I'm quoting from questions on doctrine what Ellen White says. It's in the book. He, Christ, this is Ellen White's words, he, Christ, took our human nature and bore the infirmities and the degeneracies of the race. That means that he came with a weakened physical nature. She's not talking about his spiritual nature or his moral nature. She's talking about his physical nature. He wasn't 12, 12 feet tall. He didn't uh, have the strength that Adam had when he was created. Then she says in Desire of Ages, page 49, these words, But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the working, results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results are shown in the history of his, in the, his, his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us an example of a sinless life. Right. Now, there's one thing we all agreed on. No matter which side of this debate you're on, you all agree on one thing. Jesus never committed a sin. Say amen. amen. Everybody's agreed on that point. So that's, that's harmony there. What does the, the Bible say? John 8, 46, Jesus challenged the Pharisees and Sadducees of his day, which of you convinceth me of sin? And their mouths were shut. They couldn't quote or point the finger at anything that he had said or done that was wrong. And 1 Peter 2, 22 leaves the question beyond debate when it says, who did no sin? Neither was guile found in his mouth. And glad to say all Adventists agree on that. No matter which side of the debate on the human nature of Jesus you're on, you all agree that nobody can accuse Jesus of ever committing a sinful act or saying a wrong word. He did no sin. That's clear in Bible evidence. And Ellen White, of course, supports it. Some years ago, I was uh, over in Perth with an Adventist pastor. I will not name him. He's no longer living, so let him be. But uh, he got into some of these discussions with me, and he had the idea that Jesus was sinful in his human nature. Didn't give in to it, but that he had all the urges and pulls that we carnal people have. And uh, he said to me, Sin is only actions. And I said, no. The Bible definition of sin includes sinful actions, but in the Bible, sin is described in broader terms than just sinful actions. Well, we had a bit of a debate and argument about that. But so, let's look at this question of the twofold Bible picture, Bible concept of sin, twofold. Many problems and misunderstandings have arisen because of a failure to understand that in the Bible there are two concepts of sin. All except that doing wrong actions is called sin in the Scriptures. For there are many verses that teach that. For example, John, 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Right? That's a good definition. Sinful actions are called sin. But in the Bible, sin is also used to refer to man's moral state or nature. Even when we are not committing acts of sin, we are still sinners by nature. 
The scriptures often refer to man's sinful nature as the carnal nature or the, quote, old man. Some verses from Paul talk about the old man, meaning the carnal nature of sin. When Adam and Eve sinned by their act of disobedience, they lost their sinless nature with which they were created and became sinful in nature. They then could not pass on to their children the sinless nature that they had lost. You get it? You can't give your children something you don't have. Adam and Eve sinned, lost their sinless nature and became sinful in nature and passed on to their children sinful natures. Every human being born since has had been born with a sinful nature. Strange as it may seem, this fact is not fully understood by some people. I've written another study. It's in my book called The, the Plan of Salvation in which I make a statement that all babies are born with sinful natures. And an Adventist layman ran me up on the phone and he said, Brother, he said, what is this you've written? I, I, you say we're born with sinful natures. I said, yes. Yeah, I said, I don't believe that. I said, you don't? I said, what do you believe? He said, we are born with sinless natures. And we don't get a sinful nature until we commit our first act of sin. Then we get a sinful nature. And immediately I saw the weakness of his argument and I said to him, and unfortunately he had lost a baby in infancy and I didn't know that at the time, but I uh, found out afterwards and it sort of touched him on a raw nerve, I think. I said, a baby is born. It lives for 10 minutes. It draws breath. Ten minutes later, it stops breathing and dies. You can't say that baby has committed an act of sin. Then why did it die? Because if you have a sinless human nature, you will be immortal like Adam was when he had a sinless human nature, right? Adam, when he was created, could have lived forever. Because God created him perfect, sinless. He became subject to death when he committed his first act of sin and ate the fruit that he was told not to eat. So if a baby is born with sinless human nature, you can't explain how the, a sinful father and sinful mother can give a baby a sinless nature. That, that's something they don't explain. But <coughs> if, you, if you believe that, and the baby dies, how can it die? If a sinless in its nature, it'd be like Adam before he sinned and immortal. The fact that babies die before they commit acts of sin is proof that they are subject to the laws of being born with sinful natures. Well, when I put that to him, he, he, he didn't want to answer it. He started off on another tangent. Off and off and off he went. Boy, could he talk. And I said to him, brother, you haven't answered my question. I brought him back. I said, the baby is born. It commits no act of sin. And it dies. Does that baby need a saviour to go to heaven? Or can it go to heaven without a saviour? If it had sinless nature, it didn't need a saviour to go to heaven, surely. I mean, it shouldn't have died anyway. But there's another point, you see. Does it doesn't need a saviour or not. It should have gone to heaven without a saviour if it's sinless. And he wouldn't answer me the second time. Went off on another tangent. Talking like a machine gun. I brought him back a third time. I said, brother, you have not answered my question. I put it to him again. And you know what he said? Well, if it's not committed any act of sin, it can go to heaven without a saviour. And I said, brother, I could not disagree with you more. I couldn't disagree with you more. Everybody who gets to heaven is going to get there because of the merits of Jesus, right? Including babies that never committed acts of sin. 
Ellen White talks about angels bringing back babies and putting them in the hands of the mothers that have lost them. You know, if you've lost a baby in infancy and you've got something to look forward to, angel bringing the baby back to you and putting it in your arms. Go to heaven with it. Yeah. Yes, so this is a, a faulty concept of, of what sin is. Some Bible verses spell out very clearly to us that sin is more than just wrong actions. So let's have a look at some of them. Psalm 51.5 I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's Psalm 51.5. David said, this is his psalm of repentance after he murdered Uriah and committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband by putting him in the front line of the battle with the enemy and they killed him so he could then marry her quickly and cover up his sin and try to. I was shaped in iniquity, David said, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And I quoted this once to a good friend of mine. He's still a good friend of mine, but he differed on this point with me. And he said, oh, he said, there's another way that verse can be explained. Uh, David was born illegitimate. That's what, it's, uh, that's what it's really saying. I said, where do you get that? Oh, he says, Pastor so-and-so quoted, uh, said that to me. That uh, David is admitting that he was born out of wedlock. I said, no. David is the youngest of the family. <laughs> There's no evidence David was born out of wedlock. No way at all. And I said, what do you do then with the verse in the Bible that says that a person that is born out of wedlock can't enter the congregation of the Lord till the third or fourth generation? Oh, he said, is that in the Bible? I said, yes, it's in the Bible. <laughs> and how could uh, David then be, you know, in the temple of God, worshipping and offering sacrifices and so on through the ministry of the priests if he was born out of wedlock? Another verse, Psalm 58, verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. That reminds me of Judge Judy. You ever see Judge Judy on the television? We watch her sometimes. She says, you can always tell when teenagers are lying. You know what she said? If teenagers' lips are moving, you know they're lying. <laughs> That's what Judge Judy says in her courts. If a teenager's lips are moving, you know they're lying. <laughs> they just do it automatically. Well, people say, well, this is talking about the wicked being estranged from the womb, going astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. But what about the, the ones that come from righteous parents? Well, look at Isaiah 48, verse 8. The house of Jacob is called a transgressor from the womb. I was talking about God's people. House of Jacob. Uh, let's be realistic. We've got a number of parents here. You ever seen a baby a few days old? Stiffen out his little arms and legs and scream, scream because it's not happy about something. Maybe he wants to be fed. Maybe he wants to have a nappy changed or something. And uh, it's giving vent to temper. And it's only a few weeks old. That's what this is talking about. I, I don't think Jesus was like that when he was a baby. Anyway, that's what it says. And Psalm 14 verses 1 to 3 says, There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Another verse says what? We are all dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2.12. And what about Romans 7? Oh, this is a real clear passage, Romans 7. The Apostle Paul, who called himself the chief of sinners, by the way, didn't claim to be sinless. He said, I am, present tense, notice, not I was. Some people think he's talking about before he was converted. But he wrote this after he was converted, and he says, I am. He can't tell you say that he's talking about his previous experience when he was persecuting. He's talking about his experience as a believing Christian. I am carnal, sold unto sin. And anybody who thinks that they are sinless need to look in the mirror. See the lips moving and know they're lying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I would, 
for th sorry, for that which I do, I allow not. But what I hate, that I do. Have you ever been in that position? Don't answer me. Of course, none of you, when you were kids, one week, two weeks old, screamed and yelled at a temper, did you? Only, only your children did that, not you. <laughs> uh, no, let's be realistic here. Romans seven seventeen, But sin that dwelleth in the me. That's not talking about actions. Sin's dwelling in here. And every Christian will acknowledge that there is sin principle dwelling in here. That's why we fall into sin so often when we shouldn't. Because the, the pull of the carnal nature is so strong. That's why we have to have close contact with Jesus all the time. He has the power to defeat Satan. Romans 7.18 In me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth what? No good thing. This is the carnal nature that Paul's talking about, and he calls it sin, dwelling in me. That's different from actions. Keep that in mind. The good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. This is the struggle. We all have this struggle, if we're honest with ourselves. Ellen White confirms that we all have a carnal nature from birth. In Great Controversy 469, 470, she says, Christians will feel the promptings of sin. That is, the wrong desires and urges that we have. We'll feel them. See? <laughs> Acts of the Apostles, 518. Evils within can awaken evils without. So there's evil in here. Because I've got a carnal nature. I tell you, I wish I could get rid of it. And some perfectionists say that you can before the second coming. Which is, of course, a heresy. Ellen White said, and quote is given in Bible Commentary, Volume 2, page 1031-1032, as long as life shall last, there is need of guarding the affections and passions with a firm purpose. There is inward corruption. That's why, unfortunately, some Christians of many years' experience will so sometimes fall into wrongdoing. We can all perhaps cite examples of it. We don't need to cite them to prove it. We all know that it. It can happen. Another one. That I may know him, page 269. When the feelings and desires of the natural heart are contending for the victory. The natural heart is contending for the victory against the spiritual nature that we have. When we're born again, we get a spiritual nature. That's a conversion. But the old man <coughs> doesn't die. Some people think that when they get converted and go and get baptized, they won't have a battle with self anymore. But lo and behold, they discover that we've still got to fight the temptations that we had before we converted. Paul's wills. This is Testimonies, Volume 8, page 313. Paul's wills and Paul's will and desires every day conflicted with duty and the will of God. Every day. Instead of following the inclinations, he did God's will, however crucifying to his own nature. That's what the Christian life is like. Doing what is right, even if you want to do the opposite. You do what you know is right. Signs of the Times, Ellen White, March 23, 1888. We cannot say, I am sinless, until this vile body is changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. When does that take place? Second coming. <coughs> so we've got this internal battle with our desires and the sinful nature we have until the second coming. I wish I could tell you that it was going to get rid of it before then. <coughs> Heard about the man who went to a prayer meeting regularly and one time he got up and 
having apparently having a discussion about some of these things in the prayer meeting, and he got up there, came out the front, and he said, Brethren and sisters, if you want to see someone who hasn't sinned for 20 years, look at me. Walk back and forth. And one sister in the back row back there somewhere, who knew her theology better than he did, said in a very loud whisper, He's sinning right now! <laughs> First of all, telling a lie. <laughs> and second, indulging pride. <laughs> yeah, sitting right now. And when I went to India as a missionary, we had a, a man there who was a division president. And I heard him tell a story. He said, when I was, this is the division president speaking, he said, when I was a young intern, just starting out in the work, I came to India. And we were in an old motor car going out into some village to conduct some meetings. And he said and some of the older missionaries, much older than what he was at that time, were talking about Christian living and so on. And uh, one of them said, you know, well, I haven't sinned for two years. And he said, I, I thought that was a bit strange, talk like that. But being a young intern, I thought I'd better keep my mouth shut. And so were older missionaries. But he said, when he got to the village, the meeting place was not prepared properly. They hadn't, local villagers hadn't built the reception place where they're going to have the meeting. And uh, this older missionary who hadn't sinned for two years uh, lost, his, lost his temper and said some very unsanctified words. Yeah, he, he swore. <laughs> And the intern, who is now the division president, said, <laughs> he waxed bold enough to say to the, <laughs> the older missionary brother, what about your record now? <laughs> <laughs> Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he what? Fall. Pride goeth before her. Fall. Yeah. Carnal nature is there. We cannot say I'm sinless until we are changed at the second coming. Desire of ages, 122, 123. In our own strength, it is impossible for us to deny the clamors of our fallen natures. In our own strength, we can't handle this sin no, nature that we have. That's why we have to have a close union with Jesus. That's where our power comes from. Steps to Christ, 67. Listen to this one. Even after conversion, we recognize our sinfulness. Right? If we don't see our own moral deformity, it is evidence that we have not seen the beauty of Christ's character. Yeah. Now... <coughs> Because sin is of two natures, sinful actions and sinful nature that we're all born with, we need to look at the atonement. <coughs> because Jesus needs to make an atonement for both the sinful actions and also for the sinful nature. Otherwise, babies can go to heaven without a saviour, right? So let's have a look now at this question. <coughs> what about our sinful actions? He vicariously took upon himself our sinful actions when he went to the cross Jesus took our sinful actions the Bible says so Isaiah 53 verse 6 the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all that's sinful actions right the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all 1 Peter 2 24 who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, by whose stripes we, you were healed. So he bore our sins when he went on the cross. Peter said so. Isaiah says so. But there are some Christians today who are saying Jesus did not take our sins upon him. And you may have heard me speak about this before, some of you that heard my previous lectures. Because I was a student in four of our ministerial training institutions as a student. 
Longburn College, Avondale College, Pacific Union College, Theological Seminary, and then uh, later on, Andrews University sem Seminary. And in one of those institutions, the lecturer was saying, our sins were not put on Jesus when he went on the cross. Ooh. Look, I was brought up in an Adventist pastor's house. Yeah, my ears were really burning. <laughs> my father was a pastor. <clears throat> I knew Adventist theology quite well before I began my theological training in colleges. I knew prophetic interpretation too. I brought up on it. But I had to go through and do the formal education, sit all the exams and so on to get my qualifications because I wanted to be a Bible teacher in our colleges and thank the Lord that he opened the door for me to teach Bible in four of our colleges in my lifetime. And I was chairman of the theology department in three of them. That's my background. So he said that the only reason why Jesus died was to show us that he loved us. Nothing to do with our sins going on him. Well, I knew that wasn't right, but a few days later he gave us a test in class. And the only one question, just a one period test, why did Jesus die on the cross? I knew what he taught. What am I going to write? Write a heresy and get zapped? <laughs> or write the truth? So I wrote what I believed and wrote what the Bible said. And I quoted the Bible. I quoted Isaiah 53. Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of his all. He died a vicarious death. He died in my place, taking my sins upon him. And then I put at the end of the, what I knew he wanted. It is also true that the death of Jesus on the cross shows God's great love for us and shows how far the Godhead was willing to go to save us. That's a truth, you see. A truth can be right in what it affirms, but wrong in what it denies. Get it? When I got my exam paper back, my test paper back, I had the lowest mark I think I got in any test I did in seven years of theological education study. Mark me right down hard because that wasn't what he wanted to, to hear. It's called the moral inference theory of the atonement. And I don't subscribe to Spectrum magazine because I don't agree with their agenda. A group of scholars that think that they're a cut above the rest of us and they think that's a sign of their intellectual prowess if they can attack the church and rubbish the, some of the doctrines of the church and show up some of the leaders of the church or whatever. I don't subscribe to it, but I've got a copy of it that I've kept that somebody gave me. Where a man with, I don't know how many PhDs he's got, he's certainly got one, says, Jesus is not our substitute. That's what he wrote. And they published it in Spectrum. Talk about publishing heresy. Jesus is not our substitute. Moral inference theory of the atonement. By taking on himself our sins and dying on the cross, he atoned for the sinful actions of the past. The doctrine of vicarious substitution is the very foundation of the gospel. It was seen in the Garden of Eden when an animal died instead of Adam and Eve. See, God has said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat this fruit, you'll die. But they didn't. Adam lived for 930 years. But there was death that day. What was it? A sacrifice, animal. Perhaps the skins that God provided for them to wear came from the skin animals that were sacrificed. We're not told that specifically, but I would assume that it was very possible. A substitute death that God accepted for the time being, pointing forward to the coming death of Jesus, which is a substitute death for us. Because if, if Jesus hadn't died for us, we'd have to die. Because the wages of sin is death. And incidentally, the wages of sin is eternal death. That's why Jesus could not see the resurrection when he was on the cross. He prophesied his resurrection before he was crucified, but then when he's on the cross, he said, God, why have you forsaken me? And Ellen White says that while he was hanging on the cross, he could not see the resurrection on Sunday morning. He thought that the separation was going to be for eternity. And when you consider that, that Jesus was prepared to die thinking that the separation from his Father was going to be for eternity, 
and he is still prepared to go through with it to give us a chance of salvation, does that make you want to love him more? Talk about the kids want to meet Jesus in. When I get to see Jesus, I'm going to say thank you. I think we all would. The first thing I want to say to Jesus is thank you for what you did. Yes. So, Jesus took our sins upon him. But what about atoning for our sinful nature? He took upon himself our sinful actions vicariously. Now, the word vicarious means something which is endured or suffered by somebody which brings benefit to somebody else. Get it? He vicariously took upon himself our sinful actions. But then, what about our sinful state? He has to atone for that. Otherwise, babies can go to heaven without a saviour. To deny this conclusion would leave one with the conclusion that babies who have never sinned can go to heaven without a saviour. This does not mean that Jesus was born with our sinful nature, for, but if he did not take care of the problem of our sinful natures, then his atonement would only be half an atonement. So he has to take care of both. Now we come to the real center of this whole lecture. The only way that he could atone for our sinful natures was to take it vicariously. Because if he was born with it, he'd need atonement himself. That's a point that some people don't realize. If he was born with a sinful nature, as the post-lapsarians claim, then he would need a saviour, just as a baby needs a saviour who has never committed any act of sin. A clarification of this point could be the basis of reconciliation between the two warring sides on this issue. Those who have held to the post-lapsarian view, that is, the sinful nature, we all, that uh, Jesus had a sinful nature, they rely heavily on Ellen White's statements. Prelapsarians have tried to explain the statements used by the post-lapsarians by saying that they apply to the physical nature of Jesus only, not to his moral status or his spiritual nature. A close look at some of these statements from Ellen White in the light of a twofold aspect of this, his atonement may help us to better understand what Ellen White is saying. Ministry or medical missionary, medical ministry rather, 181. Now listen carefully to this. He, Jesus, took upon himself, he took upon his sinless nature. Well, there he had a sinless nature, didn't he? Jesus took upon his sinless nature, our sinful nature, that he might know how to succor those that are tempted. Now, of course, the post lapsarians say, there you are, Jesus took our, uh, our sinful nature. But he wasn't, I don't believe he was born with it. He took it by choice, as he took our actions, wrong actions by choice. Review and Herald. Clad in vestments of humanity. This is Ellen White. The Son of God came down to the level of those he wished to save. In him was no guile of sinfulness. He was ever pure and undefiled. Yet he took upon himself our sinful nature. Well, how could he do that? Only vicariously. Like he took our sinful actions vicariously. He didn't do the sinful actions that we have done, but he took them on himself. So now he's saying that he took our sinful nature vicariously upon himself. So that he could atone for that as well. Desire of Ages. Page 112. Notwithstanding that the sins of a guilty world were laid upon Christ, notwithstanding the humiliation of taking upon himself our fallen nature, the voice from heaven declared him to be the Son of the Eternal. Now, Jesus was not born with sinful human nature. Let's look at some evidence. As already stated, Jesus was sinless in his life. He never committed an act of sin. The teaching that he vicariously took upon himself our sinful nature means that this was a choice he made, just as he chose to take our actions, sinful actions, upon himself when he went on the cross. 
The Bible very clearly teaches that Jesus was born with sinless human nature. Take these verses. Hebrews 7.26 He was holy, H-O-L-Y, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Get it? That's Jesus as he was born. John 3 verse 5 In him was no sin. You can't say that about Paul. He said sin dwells in me and every other human being born after Adam and Eve. <clears throat> in him was no sin. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Pilate's wife said, have nothing to do with that just man. Gabriel called him that holy thing that shall be born to Mary. The devil said of Jesus that he was the Holy One of God. Ellen White supports the Bible positions when she says in Signs of the Times, May 29, 1901, he took the nature but not the sinfulness of man. He took our nature, human nature, yes, 100% man, but not the sinfulness of na our nature when he was born. Signs of the times, in taking upon himself man's fallen nature, in man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. He was subject to the infirmities and weaknesses with which man is encompassed. He should ha we should have no misgivings in regard to the perfect sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. That's Ellen White. No misgivings. We should have no misgivings in regard to the perfect sinlessness of Jesus. Our high calling. Jesus was sinless. With this exception, his condition was as yours. So there's the exception. He was sinless. All right. There's more on this in uh, Questions on Doctrine, page 650 to 652. Now, some time years ago, I came across a very, very exciting quote from Ellen White that really pulls all the study we have together, put this afternoon, really pulls it all together. Many have wondered why Jesus was baptized when he never committed an act of sin. Oh, we've always uh, always said, well, he gave us, uh, did it, he got baptized to give us an example to what we should do. So he just did it to give us an example. Well, yeah, no doubt there's some truth in that. To answer this question, many have presented the thought that he went through the ceremony in order to give us an example of what we need to do. Others have suggested that he was baptized so that his baptism could count for those who never had the chance to be baptized. A vicarious baptism. Okay? Yeah, there's some truth in that, I think, too. What about the thief on the cross? Did he have a chance to get baptized? No. But he'd be in heaven. Jesus told him, you'll be in paradise with me one day. Both these reasons, no doubt, have merit. But there seems to be a deeper meaning when we read what Ellen White said about the baptism of Jesus. And I'm going to read you this statement now. <coughs> At a general conference session held in April 1901, which was a very important general conference session in America, Ellen White just went back from Australia and uh, <coughs> settled back in America and she... Uh, uh, gave a talk at the general conversation. That's when they reorganized the administrative uh, structure of the, of the church, 1901. What did she say there about the baptism of Jesus? 1901, she gave this talk on April 3. It was printed in the general conference bulletin dated the next day, April 4, 1901. And in the fourth paragraph of the printed transcript of her talk, this is what she said. Now listen very, very closely. We're nearly finished. The Lord can take every one of us in his embrace, for his arm encircles the race. Good news, isn't it? Let us remember this. Remember what? Let us remember this. 
after Christ had taken the necessary steps in repentance, conversion, and faith in behalf of the human race, that's vicariousness, he went to John to be baptized of him in Jordan. John forbade him, saying, I need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Jesus answered, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. When he came up out of the water, he knelt down on the banks of the Jordan and offered a prayer such as had never before entered heaven. While he was praying, the heavens opened, and the glory of God in the form of a dove of burnished gold rested upon him, and from the highest heaven was heard the voice of the Infinite One, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, listen. Since we believe that Jesus never sinned, he had no need to repent. Clear? Certainly had nothing to repent of in his own life. He didn't need to be converted <laughs> because he was a believer all the time. The only way that this passage could be understood and interpreted is to come to the conclusion that Jesus went through the steps of repentance, conversion, faith, and baptism for each one of us vicariously. Just as he vicariously took upon himself our sinful actions, he took upon himself our sinful natures, natures, and, uh, <coughs> yes, he vicariously went through these steps of repentance, conversion, faith, and baptism in order that we can be declared right with God. After all, <coughs> we all would have to admit that our repentance is rather imperfect, to say the least. For after we have repented, we so often fall into sin again. Ever committed a sin or made a mistake after your baptism? Yeah. Likewise, our conversion is less than perfect for the same reason. The same could be said about our exercise of faith and also our baptism. We could therefore conclude that Jesus took these steps for us vicariously. Repentance, conversion, baptism, faith. Because we take them so imperfectly. His perfect steps count for us when we accept him as our saviour, just as his righteousness is counted as for us when we accept Jesus. So these steps that he took are counted for us, and they are all done perfectly for us on our behalf. Thus the gospel of righteousness by faith appears to have a far deeper meaning than many of us have realised in the past. How thankful we should all be for a wonderful Saviour who not only saves us by forgiving our sins but also vicariously took our sinful nature and when he had taken vicarious steps that are necessary for our salvation because we take them so imperfectly, he took them perfectly for us. So when we accept Jesus, not only do we have the Righteousness of Jesus credited to us, but the baptism of Jesus is credited to us, and his conversion is credited to us, and his repentance, for our repentance is imperfect, so his perfect repentance on our behalf is accepted by the Father, and baptism and all. What a wonderful Saviour. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you and thank you for your wonderful provision for our salvation. We know, Lord, that we are so weak, we are so imperfect. <coughs> but we thank thee that the righteousness of Jesus is without spot or wrinkle and it counts for us if we accept him as our substitute. And that these steps that he took on behalf of the sinful race also taken on our behalf, we pray that each one of us may appropriate what he provides for us and have a place in his kingdom when he comes is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.